I wonder whether you've ever had a bit of a surprise, and I mean a real surprise, like a bit of a shock surprise. Uh, you met someone or something, or maybe you chanced upon someone or something, you happened upon something or someone, and it was very surprising. It was very unexpected. Now, the dictionary calls that sort of experience an encounter. When you look up encounter, this will be the definition, an experience that is surprising or unexpected. But then again, there's good surprising, isn't there? And there's bad surprising as well. About six weeks ago now, we had good surprise. My wife, Belinda, who's sitting over there, we welcomed into the world our very first grandchildren six weeks ago. And you heard me say that right, the plural, because they were twins. A little boy and a little girl, six weeks old. That was good surprising. But then again, you and I might head off home after the service tonight and we're driving home and then we look in our rear view mirror and we see another set of twins. But this is a set of twin flashing blue lights. That's bad surprising. There's good, there's bad. Now these surprising and unexpected experiences, these encounters can be across the spectrum, I think, both in their shape but also in their intensity. For example, I think you can have amusing encounters. Now, those of you who know me know that in a previous life, I was in law enforcement. And one particular night, I was on patrol with my mate and we got an unusual call. It was to head out to one of the northern suburbs because there was some sort of disturbance going on. Apparently, people were putting up, pulling up to sets of traffic lights in the dark and then some guy was coming out of the dark, out of nowhere, and just scaring the daylights out of them. He'd jump on their bonnets, he'd smash on their windows, he'd yell at them, just scare them to half to death. And so we got this unusual call. Well, we turned up and surprise, surprise, there he was. And so we grabbed him. And I remember I walked him across to the patrol car, turned him around, uh, searched him, made sure he had nothing untoward on him, and then spun him around because in my search, I located some syringes. They were in his top pocket and I spun him around and held them up in front of his face and I said, what are these for? Now I knew what these were for, but he's looking at me and then I had one of these beautiful moments where I suddenly realised I knew exactly what this guy was thinking. It was like some sort of telepathic connection. I knew he was immediately trying to think of all the legal, legitimate uses for syringes and he's racking his brains trying to decide what do people use syringes for? What's that thing you have when you have to use insulin? What's it called? What's it called? What's it called? And I'm starting to laugh because I know what he's thinking. And then he starts to laugh because he knows that I know what he's thinking. And we're both laughing at each other. I'm like looking going, go on, have a go, have a crack. Come on, have a go. And I still remember it, wondering what it is. Is it, is it for diabetes or is it for, is it for asthma? What, what do you use the syringes for? And I said, what is it? And he looked at me and he went, yeah, these are mine and, and I'm supposed to have them because I've got asthma. <laughs> <laughs> so close and yet so far. And he was a really cool guy. We sort of helped him out later in the night. So you can have amusing encounters and then you can have amazing encounters as well. Now, again, some of you who know me know that I ride motorcycles and I've got a thing where the original makers call it a Ducati Multistrada V4 Essa. Uh, you and I call it a Ducati. Fellow Ducatisti right there, my friend, my Duca buddy, John there. And anyway, this particular bike has got, um, in my right wrist here on the right-hand throttle, 170 horsepower. That's an experience. It's both terrifying and energising at the same time. That right-hand throttle sometimes feels less like an accelerator and more like a detonator. You really have different experiences. They can be amusing, they can be amazing. But other times you can have also experiences and encounters that are altering, that are life transforming, that sort of change us and impact us more deeply than others are. Uh, I wonder if you've ever experienced something like that, something that just went deeper, was just, it was changed you, it altered you. You were never the same again. One that's personal to me was the day that I met my beautiful wife, Belinda. 
Now we were at a Christian student conference. We were over in Canberra. We traveled across the country. This is when we were living in WA. And I saw Belinda and she was so beautiful and so clearly out of my league um, that I just couldn't even recall even, even saying hello to her, but I actually did say hello to her. Now she doesn't rem remember this, but my recollection was that she just seemed a little aloof to me. That's my recollection. Now, it really was my insecurity speaking more than any sort of demeanor or attitude in Belinda. And I then remembered her because one year later, we came to the same conference. Now a year later, this time it was in Melbourne. And I saw her again and I remembered her. I remembered her as that alluring and yet aloof woman from last year. And then I realized to my absolute shock that I had completely misread her. She wasn't aloof. In fact, she became, and I came to know her as the kindest and most humble person I think I've ever met. And one night, oh, did you hear that? Oh, did you hear that? That was very powerful, thank you for that. One night I was sitting next to her, so I scored the, you know, the prize, sitting next to her at a session. I remember Dr. John White was the speaker. He's a guy who wrote a book called The Fight. It's a bit of an old Christian classic going back many decades. But anyway, he's speaking. And then during his speaking, he referred to a Bible. Now, this is back in the days when Bibles were made of paper and leather. Does anyone remember those days? I know some in the room, this is news to you, but they used to be made of paper and leather, and I had a beauty. It was like this thick. It was an NIV study Bible in brown leather. It was decent. You could do arm curls with it. It was a decent Bible. And so I'm sitting there, and I had it open on my lap, and Belinda is sitting to my right, and Dr. John White refers to a Bible passage. I have it in front of me, so me just being kind, I moved the Bible to my right so that Belinda could look on. Now, Belinda being lovely, she moved across to help support this very heavy leather-bound Bible. You know where I'm going with this. And then this amazing moment happened as I'm holding the Bible this side, Belinda's holding the Bible that side, and her left forearm right there came to rest on my right upper leg right there. <laughs> what a moment. And I started to have an internal conversation. Now, I'm sorry to Dr. John White, but he just faded into the distance. I wasn't listening to him anymore. And I have this internal conversation. I remember thinking to myself, Belinda's arm is resting on my leg. I don't think it should be resting on my leg, but it is resting on my leg. And frankly, I'm pretty pleased it's resting on my leg. Does she know her arm is resting on my leg? She must know her arm is rest. I'm having this internal conversation. You know, does that mean what I think it means and so on? This, see, this is why relationships, particularly romantic relationships, are both exciting and excruciating all at the same time, aren't they? And here we are, my darling, 35 long, hard years later. Here we are. Okay. So I've learned over the years I've learned over the years that some encounters, they can be amusing, they can be amazing, but some can be altering, life transforming. You know, they change you, they deepen you, and we're never the same again. Now, pastors Phil and Lucinda, they have called our church to health, to be healthy in God, healthy in faith, in spirit, in character, in relationships. And we've been focusing our attention on the Holy Spirit who he is and what he does. Why? Why the Holy Spirit? Well, the reason is this. He's the one, if you are a follower of Jesus, he's the one who lives in you, he is with you, and he will bring health to you. We've been called to health, and the helper, the Holy Spirit, he's the one we're focusing on because he's the one we need. He's the one in us. He's with us and he's gonna bring health to us. Now we're gonna encounter this wonderful Holy Spirit if we lean in to that space between him and us. And when you do, when you encounter the Holy Spirit, it is a life transforming encounter. It's not just amazing, it's life altering. 
It's life transforming because you get to encounter the one true and living God who loves us just as we are, but he loves us too much to leave us just as we are. He's ready to change us, to deepen us, to bring health to us. That's the Holy Spirit. You see, the God of the Bible, he's revealed as Trinity, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so intimately connected to each other that they are, that he is one God. Perfect mystery, perfect relationship. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that third person, the Holy Spirit, in the Hebrew Old Testament, he's known as the Ruach Adonai. He almost conjures up this image of a wind blowing across the desert or down a desert canyon. As you move to the Greek New Testament, he's the Numa Tutheu, the wind, the breath, the spirit of God. Notice both of those names are onomatopoeic. In other words, their sound echoes their meaning. Numa, Ruach, wind breath, spirit, the exhalation of God's very being toward us. This is the Holy Spirit of God. And each of these persons has a role. If the Father is God over us, in that He loves the world, He sends His Son into the world. If the Son is God for us, because He came to this earth as one of us, He took our place on the cross for us, He rose from the grave for the salvation of us, then the Holy Spirit is God in us. God is over, the Son is for, the Spirit is in us, applying to us what the Son achieved for us on the cross, working in us what the Son won for us in His resurrection. He is in us, He is with us. You see, the Holy Spirit is where the Trinity, God as Trinity becomes personal, and it becomes practical. Have a listen to the words of Jesus here, speaking about the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14. This is what he says. Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. Brilliant translation of parakletos. It literally means the one called alongside to help. So sometimes you see it translated as counsellor, advocate, here, helper. Great translation. To be with you forever even the spirit of truth. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. It's through the Holy Spirit that we encounter God, this divine human encounter that is life altering. And this encounter for me, for many in this room, for millions around the globe and for billions through human history has been the deepest, most profound, most life-altering, transformative encounter of our lives. But if the Holy Spirit is this agent of transformation, if he's this envoy of encounter in a follower of Jesus, what are some pointers to his presence? In other words, what are some evidences that there has been an encounter? Like, how do we know? What does it look like? when the Holy Spirit is at work within us. We've just heard that he will be with us and in us, applying to us what the Son won for us, working in us, applying to us. What does it look like? What are the signs of the Spirit in us? And if you're taking notes and you're looking for a title, there it is, the signs of the Spirit. There's the title. And there are many signs of the Spirit, but tonight I'm gonna to be very Trinitarian and give you three, three among many. Signs of the Spirit, evidences of encounter, and they revolve around three words that I'm hoping I've made alliterative to try and make them sticky so they stick in our psyche so that we don't just leave tonight and then tomorrow morning can't remember a thing. I'm hoping that by tomorrow you're gonna remember these three words, these three signs of the Spirit in our lives. And the three words are these, character, capacity, Christ. Character, the fruit of the Spirit. Capacity, the gifts of the Spirit. Christ, the focus of the Spirit. Three signs of the Spirit being at work within us. So let's look at the first one. And it comes with this word attached, integrity. Integrity in character, the fruit of the Spirit. What's integrity? Well, integrity is the marker of the integrated person. So what does that mean? An integrated person is when our behaviour matches our beliefs. 
In other words, there's a consistency between our convictions and our conduct, what we think and what we say, our internal attitudes, our external actions, our private life and our public life. That's integrity. When what's out there is the same as what's in here. That's integrity. And markers of this integration of character are called the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Now, a leader in the early church, a guy by the name of Paul, he wrote about these. And he wrote it to a church in an area in modern day Turkey, right in the centre of modern day Turkey, back then in the first century, was called Galatia. So to the churches in Galatia. And this is what he wrote in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23. And he starts to list these markers of the Spirit, these signs of the Spirit being at work within us. He begins, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. And here we go. Love. That's the word you may have heard of before, agape. Desiring another person's highest good. That's agape love. Joy, kara, inner gladness. Peace, arene, an inner serenity. This is why in the first century, those were very popular names. Kara, arene, joy, peace. Today we say kara and Irene. Or we say to someone, they've got a very irenic pious personality, not ironic, irenic personality, which means they're a peace-loving sort of person. Irene is peace, love, joy, peace, patience, macrothemia, a steadiness despite the unknowns, kindness, where you just want to bless and benefit others, goodness, a heart that's inclined toward another person's welfare, faithfulness, someone who's worthy of trust, who honours their commitments, who does what they say they're going to do. Gentleness, humble, unassuming, considerate, and then self-control. Self-controlled, because you don't want to hurt, you don't want to disappoint, you don't want to damage anyone else. And then Paul says, against these, there is no law against these things. There is no law against these things. Now, this is a representative list. It's not exhaustive. There's no evidence to say that these are the only fruit of the Spirit. These are representative. In fact, you can look elsewhere and you'll find other fruits of the Spirit. Colossians 3, 12 to 13 has got its own little list. Some of the ones in this list are in that list as well. And then a few added to it. Things like compassion is added. Humility is added, for example. Making space, giving allowance, a bit of margin for each other's faults. Translated normally is bear with one another. But a great translation is in the New Living Translation. Just make allowance, give a bit of space. We're all broken, we're all gonna muck up, we're all gonna stuff up. Just let's give a bit of margin to each other. That's kindness at work. Actions that are against no law. It's an interesting statement, isn't it? There is no law against these things. What does Paul mean by that? There's no law against these things. These, these fruit that he's mentioned. Well, when you think about it, actions that are against the law usually take from someone else, don't they? You know, stealing, taking property. Murder, taking life. Lying, taking trust. But things that contribute to other people, they're never against the law. And that's Paul's point. See, spiritual fruit are attractive and they're productive. They bring blessing to us, but they also bring blessing to others. That's Paul's point. And one of the signs of the Spirit being at work in the life of a person who has invited the Spirit into their life by placing their faith in Jesus Christ are these. There's an integrity of character that the Spirit forms in you, and it's evidenced by the fruit of the Spirit. If He's the tree, these are the fruit. And you can see it in people. You can see it in people. It just shines, it's there. It's a wonderful thing to see. But that's the first marker, if you like, of an encounter with God by His Holy Spirit, a first sign of the Spirit. The second one though, if that is character, the second one, remember, capacity. And this time I'm gonna attach the word unity in capacity, the gifts of the Spirit. You see, God's Spirit, if you are a follower of Jesus, he lives in you and He gives gifts, 
gifts to you. Now, what are gifts? Well, they're special abilities that are given to you to serve others. They bless others and they bind us to others. They sort of express and encourage a unity that we are one body in Christ. Let's have a look at some of the language that the New Testament uses to talk about these gifts. Here's the Apostle Peter, one of the original 12, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, and this is what he writes. Each of you should use whatever gift. Now the word there is charisma, where we get the English word charismatic, a charisma. Notice right in the middle of it is the word charis, grace. Favour that's undeserved, unearned. It's nothing you can do to earn it, nothing you can do to deserve it. God just gives it anyway. That's what grace is. And a gift is a grace gift. It's a charisma. Notice he goes on. Each of you should use whatever charisma you have received to what? Serve others. So it's supposed to go to you, to go through you, to bless others. So you're not the primary reason for why the gift has been given to you. You're the recipient only so that you can then pass it on and bless someone else. It's interesting, isn't it? If you're a follower of Jesus in this room tonight, you have by definition, the Holy Spirit living in you. And by definition, He's already starting to grow the fruit, developing your character, and He's already given to you gifts. You may not even know what they are, but He has given gifts to you. Now, the interesting thing is you may receive one, some indirect blessing of that gift, but that's not the primary reason you've been given that gift. Like it's gone to you, but it's not for you. It's actually for the people sitting around you right now. That's who it's for. The gift goes to you to go through you to bless someone else. Because notice, each of you should use whatever charisma you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's Charis in its various forms. The charisma gives and brings charis to others. The grace gift brings grace to others. Note the trajectory. God's grace gifts come to us to go through us. We gain so we can give. We receive so we can serve. Gifts aren't primarily for us. They're for those around us. They're given to us to go through us. And then you get a number of lists of gifts given in the New Testament. There's actually a number of lists, quite a few. None of the lists are exhortive, exhaustive. A lot of the lists overlap with each other. And I'm gonna have just one list I'm gonna bring to your attention. One such list is in a letter by a guy, the same guy, Paul, who wrote to the church in Galatia. Here he's writing to a church in a place called Corinth. You can visit Corinth to this day. The ruins are still there. It's on this little, what's called an isthmus, a little strip of land between the Greek mainland and the Peloponnese Peninsula. You've got the western port and the eastern port, and there's Corinth right in the middle, a big mountain behind it called the Acre Corinth. And there was a church right there. It was like a melting pot of different religions. It was a commercial centre, business centre. And this is Paul writing to a church, a little Christian community, followers of Jesus in that place in the first century. And this is what he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we kick it off in verse 7. A spiritual gift, writes Paul, so a charisma, a giver of grace, a grace gift, is given to each of us so what? We can help each other. Note the trajectory again. Same as 1 Peter 4, comes to you, to go through you to bless others. You're not the primary reason. You'll get some residual indirect blessing, but it's not actually for you. It's for the people around you. That's what the gift is for. The nature of the gift is other-centred. Other-centred, that's the trajectory here. He goes on. To one person in verse eight, to one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice, the gift of wisdom. This is this, this ability that understands God's perspective on a situation and then can bring insight that's going to be helpful and not harmful. Just an insight that sort of cracks the code, it gets to the core of the issue, the core of the problem. That's wisdom, wise insight. He goes on to another. The same spirit gives a message of special knowledge, the gift of knowledge. Now I think God is big enough where that can simply mean that you know a lot and that God extends that ability that He's already given you for the blessing of the body of Christ. 
We need people with the gift of knowledge in leadership positions on boards and so on, because they bring an expertise to that. Why can't that be a gift of the Spirit? Why can't someone who's got expertise in legal matters be gifted by God to take that knowledge and then push it and enhance it for the blessing of the body of Christ? But I think it can also include what we might call a special knowledge, an unusual revelation of some information, some knowledge that's gonna be beneficial, a particular knowledge for a specific situation. Now, when that happens, we need great wisdom. I remember a number of years ago reading a book. I actually know one of the people who's described in this book. He's a pastor I've met and know and trust. And he and his friend Rob, as two pastors, they took a group of young adults from their church away for a weekend, like a spiritual retreat. And then while they're with them, they were gonna just spend time leaning into the Spirit and asking specifically for the Spirit to bring revelation, illumination, so they can bring healing to people. Now, one day, one afternoon, they were there and they said, right, we're gonna pray for people and we're just gonna ask God by His Spirit to drop things, prompt things into our hearts and our minds that hopefully will be beneficial. A young lady volunteered. She came and sat on the, on the chair in front of everyone else. And then I, both pastors, one on either side, and with permission, they put a, their hands on her shoulder and they said, well, we're gonna pray for you and just share whatever God seems to drop into our hearts, into our spirit. So they're praying. Now, Martin over here, he's praying and he has got zip, like zero. He's completely blank, there is nothing. He looks at Rob, in, inquiring with his face. Have you got something? Rob's over here and he's looking at Martin and his eyes are bulging and he's going, no, no. But it's not like a no, I've got nothing. It's like, no, I don't want to go there, sort of no. So Martin here, he says, okay, so he keeps praying. Zero. He looks up at his friend again. Rob's got the same look. And then Rob showed great wisdom because something had dropped into his spirit. But boy, you want to be careful. And what he said to the young lady was this, rather than saying, this just dropped into my spirit, he said, before you became a Christian, was there something about the way you lived that you feel now is like it's baggage for you, that it's actually marking you in a negative way? And she nodded, yeah. And he said, is there a particular word that you attach to that? And instantly and in tears, she said, yes, whore. W-H-O-R-E. And she said, before I was a Christian, I looked for love in all the wrong places. And even though I'm forgiven by God's grace, some of the residue is still there. Some of the damage is still there. And then they immediately prayed for her to be released and she was. She was set free. Now, can you imagine if Pastor Rob said, hey, look, the word that occurs to me is the word because he could have been wrong. This is where you need wisdom. This is where you need wisdom. We talked about it the other week. Ask the question, is it obedient to the Word of God? Is it obedient to the Word of God? Is it glorifying to the Son of God? Ask that question. Is it tested by the people of God? Is it accompanied by life and peace from God? Is it encouraging to the church of God? Just apply these tests just to make sure that you're applying wisdom. So that's the gift of knowledge, special knowledge. Then he moves on into verse nine. The same spirit, writes Paul, gives great faith to another. This is not saving faith, it's not credulity, it's not just optimism, it's not the power of positive thinking with a bit of a religious twist, no, no, no. This is a deep conviction a deep expectant um, awareness, a deep confidence that God will move in a seemingly impossible situation. That's the gift of faith. To someone else, he writes, the one spirit gives the gift of healing. Now, I'm praying for healing. I remember praying for healing for an elderly couple in a church. I made a mind who's a pastor, he invited me, I came along. And we turned around and we started to pray in the middle of the meeting. And I still remember if memory serves me right, she had very bad arthritis in her hip and he had been injured, his shoulder had been injured. I prayed for both of them at the same time with the same amount of faith, he was instantly healed and she wasn't. I have no idea why. I rang a week later just to double check because sometimes healings take a few days. No, all good. And I said, what about your husband? Yes, absolutely set free completely healed. 
So I have no idea why that occurs. But what I do know is that we're commanded by God to pray for healing and then to leave it in his hands. And I know that he is sovereign over, but he's also surprising in. He sometimes turns up in the most surprising and wonderful ways, the gift of healing. Then he goes on in verse 10, he gives one person the power to perform miracles. This is a very broad term, really covering a whole range of miraculous interventions. Another, the ability to prophesy that often involves foretelling and forthtelling. So foretelling about the future, foretelling, speaking into the present. Old Testament prophets were like that. Isaiah would speak into the present and then every now and again, you get a chapter 53 and he points to the future. And prophecy is often has those double dimensionalities there, the gift of prophecy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. This is diacresis. It's to weigh in the balance, it's to evaluate, it's to judge, to discern right from wrong, truth from error. Still another person in verse 10, the second half, is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, whilst another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. I remember being in a church with a good friend of mine, Cheers, he was standing next to me in the middle of worship, just as we're sort of coming off one song and we're just about to go into the next one, right in that little lull, from about 20 metres behind me, this voice rose. And it was one of those things that sends a shiver down your spine. Everything in my spirit, nothing was like sending alarm bells. Everything was saying, this is something. And it didn't draw attention to itself and it was just a man's voice rose in a language I've never heard before. And then it just quietened down, almost like people almost hadn't noticed. And I turned to Cheers and I did what I think the New Testament tells you to do in public worship. I said, can you keep your eyes peeled for someone who may come forward with an interpretation of what we just heard? Chiz looked at me with a big shock on his face. I had no idea because the person who received the revelation was Chiz. He was hosting the service, so he got up and he said, look, we just had something occur then. Some of you may have heard it. Uh, We call that the gift of tongues, glossolalia, tongue speaking. And he said, and what we believe is that this is given for personal edification. It really builds people up, but it can also be given for public edification if it's interpreted. And I believe this is what was said. And then he shared the encouragement because it's always given to build up, not to tear down. That's the nature of the Holy Spirit of God. I'm running out of time. Here we go. Verse 11. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. See, notice that. The Holy Spirit is the source of the gifts. The Holy Spirit is sovereign over the gifts. This list is not exhaustive. Further down, he lists other gifts. Gifts like teaching and helping and healing. And then he's got an amazing gift. In Greek, it's kubernesis. It's like a combination to administer, manage, lead, all mixed into one. Literally, it means piloting, someone who's like holding the tiller of a boat, someone who's got the helm of a ship, steering the vessel, keeping it on course, eye on the destination, avoiding dangers, adjusting according to wind shifts and weather changes, knowing the capability of the craft, knowing the capability of the crew, that's kubernesis. Often just translated as a gift of administration, it's way more than what we might just think as administration. It's almost like the combo of what Peter Drucker used to say when he used to say leadership and management, what's the difference? Leadership, doing the right things. Management, doing things right. Kubernesis is both of those. And boy, does the Christian church need Kubernesis people right now. I'm dreaming one day that we're gonna have a service and we're gonna call people to the front. We say, right, we're gonna pray for gifts and we're gonna pray for the gift of administration. Come on down. Because the church needs great managers. The church needs great leaders in that sense who know how to make things happen. So gifts are about capacity. Fruit is about character. Gifts about what we're doing. Fruit is about who we're becoming. And can I say to something just to maybe the younger people in the room just for a moment, with the permission of being maybe just a little bit older than some in the room. Can I just say this to you? When we're talking about character and we're talking about capacity, never let your character fall behind your capacity because it will make a shipwreck of your soul. 
always ensure your character is running way ahead of your capacity. Lead with character, lead with integrity and let God give the giftings you need. Prioritise character over capacity. If you do the other way around, you're going to be in strife. Just a bit of advice. (laughs) And then this maybe leads us to the final and most important sign of the Spirit because if I'm saying to you, just let the fruit grown in you guide the gifts given to you, that leads us to this most important evidence of encounter, this sign of the Spirit, and it's this one, maturity in Christ, the focus of the Spirit. The Spirit's role is to point us to Jesus Christ. That's what He does, that's what He is. He makes us like Christ. There's a Christocentricity to His role. So next time you're in Scrabble, it's a great word. It'll learn you lots of points. Christocentricity, okay? There's a Christocentrism to the Spirit's role. He's sometimes called the shy member of the Trinity because every time you pay attention to Him, He deflects the attention onto the Son of God. Every time you wanna focus on the Spirit of God, He just steps to the side and deflects to the Son of God. Why does He do that? Because Jesus said He would. Here's the words of Jesus, John 16, 14, speaking about the Spirit. He, says Jesus, the Spirit, He, the Spirit, will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. He, the Spirit, will glorify me, the Son. He glorifies Christ. He teaches us about Christ. He lifts up Christ. He shapes our character to be like Christ. He builds our capacity to serve others in the name of Christ. It is all about Christ. Look at the words of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter four, as he starts to talk about some of these gifts. This is one of the other lists. And this is what he writes. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. Why? To prepare God's people for works of service. Why? So that the body of Christ might be built up until we all reach. So what's the end game? Where are we heading? until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, so unity, and we become mature, maturity, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Notice, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers are given to equip the body of Christ so the body of Christ can be built up so that we reach unity and we develop maturity. The Holy Spirit points us to Christ and wants to make us like Christ. So the signs of the Spirit of God in your life, if you are a follower of Jesus, can be wrapped around character, capacity, Christ. He shapes our character in fruit. He grows our capacity in gifts and He focuses our attention on Christ. Let me finish with this. And team, why don't you come and join me? Years ago, I had an encounter with God that changed my life. And it wasn't when I came to faith, it was subsequent to that. For some strange reason, I went through a season where I was just plagued by these really bad memories of the past. Now, I suspect all of us sort of have what you might call skeletons in the closet. If we just think about our past, you know, it'll be things that we said or things that we thought or things that we did or things that we didn't do that we look back now with regret, maybe even recoil from the memories of them. They send a shiver down our spine. Well, for me, that led me to a really just a terrible internal nightmarish period of accusation, of condemnation. I remember it very, very clearly. I think some of the accusation was just self just me coming down on myself. But I also think the evil one was more than happy to help me and come down on me because he is called the accuser. He is the accuser. You know, the Greek word hot diabolos, devil, it actually means slanderer. He's a liar, you can't trust him. Satanas literally means adversary, he's the enemy. And sometimes you use an adjective, hot ekthros, it means the one who is hostile, i.e. enemy. 
not to be trusted. He is set against you. So I'm sure he was more than happy to help with the condemnation that I was already feeling. And I went through this nightmarish period, a deep agony of soul. I remember I was praying most days and praying most of the days. I remember falling to my knees next to my bed time and time again. Now in God's providence, Belinda was at this point actually a part of my life and God led me. And I have to say, He led me kicking and screaming in a spiritual sense. He led me kicking and screaming to put into practice what we read in James 5, 16. I wonder if you know the verse, it says this, confess your sins one to another, pray for each other so that you might be healed. And I remember speaking with Belinda about this soul stuff that was happening in me. And then a moment came when God stepped in and just lifted it. And He did this thorough and deep work in me that has marked me to this very day. I discovered what it really means to encounter the amazing grace of God. The amazing grace of God, unearned, undeserved, unmerited, and yet real and lasting. I was not condemned, I am forgiven. This is why Romans chapter eight is such a favourite for me, particularly the first verse, which reads as follows. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. The Spirit sets people free. Signs of the Spirit, character, capacity, Christ. He shapes our character in fruit. He grows our capacity in gifts, but He focuses our attention on Christ. And He's the one who can set us free from sin and death. See, when you encounter God, you'll encounter something that will be surprising, but it will be life transforming. And my prayer is that you're gonna encounter Him today, that you will encounter the greatness and the goodness of the one true and living God. Why don't you pray with me? Let's pray together. Father, we thank You that You are with us. We thank You that You are for us. And we thank You that You offer to be in us by Your Holy Spirit. And so Father, we now just wanna say thank You. Thank You for growing our character. Thank You for blessing us with gifts that can bless others. But thank You always for pointing us to Jesus Christ. And we say thank You now in the Name of that Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. I wonder just for a moment longer, would you mind just keeping your heads bowed and your eyes closed with me? Because in every service, we give people an opportunity to say yes to Jesus, to the great and the good news of Jesus, that God became human in Jesus, the one true King. And He came to rescue, restore and transform this world that He loves so much that in Jesus, God became Him and became one of us, that He died on the cross in the place of us, that He rose from the grave for the salvation of us. And His promise is that when we respond to Him in faith, now to have faith in someone means to believe in, to trust in, to cling to, to rely upon. So when we believe in, trust in, cling to, rely upon who Jesus is and what He did for us by dying on the cross in our place, we will be saved, we'll be set free, we'll come into a relationship with our Heavenly Father. Romans 10, 9 says this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you'll be saved. Confess with your mouth, that's an external confession. In other words, we say it. Believe in your heart. That's an internal conviction. In other words, we mean it. You'll be saved. We say it, we mean it, and we'll be saved. And this may be you today. You might be in this room right now or online and listening to my voice right now, and you've never made this decision. And in a moment, we're gonna pray a prayer, and I'm gonna invite you to be a part of that prayer that that prayer will apply to you. But you also might be in this room and you've made a decision before, but the sense that you have in yourself is that you've walked away. It's not that He's taken His eyes off you, He hasn't. You feel like you've taken your eyes off Him. But I want you to know that He has never taken His eyes off you. And today might be the moment for you to recommit, rededicate your life to Him. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, 
If this is you saying yes to Jesus for the first time or maybe saying yes to Him for a subsequent time, can I ask you just to put your, slip your hand up in the air nice and high right now and I'll acknowledge it so I know who we're praying for. God bless you. God bless you. A number of hands. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thanks you. Lower your hands. Okay, why don't we pray this prayer? And I'm gonna ask everyone in the room to join voices, but this is particularly for those who raise their hand tonight. Why don't we pray together? My Father in heaven, today I decide to follow Jesus. He gave Himself for me, so I give myself to Him. He died for me. I will now live for Him. Please forgive me, transform me. Fill me with Your Holy Spirit. And in Jesus' Name I pray. And everyone can say, Amen, Amen. Why don't we put our hands together? Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. That is the best decision you could possibly have made. And can I say to you, it will be life altering, life transforming. The Holy Spirit, when you encounter Him in grace and in fullness, you'll never be the same again. And the God by Spirit who spoke to you in your heart just then, who whispered to you to say yes, is the same God, the same Spirit who speaks to you in His Word. Whisper and Word will always be the same. They'll be consistent with one another. It's the same Spirit. So let me encourage you, if you made that decision, as you exit tonight, there's gonna be some wonderful people holding this high. And if you made a decision, just walk up and say, hey, can I have one of those? And they'd love to place it in your hand. And let me encourage you not only to read God's Word, but actually gather with God's people. Following Jesus is not to be done on your own. It's to be done in community. And this is a community where you can belong as you grow in what you believe. You are welcome in this place. Well, God bless you guys. It's been such a privilege. Thank you for listening. And we'll see you soon.